Well, welcome everybody. Welcome everybody to Sailor Beach Bible Church. Our first online video. Now, those who don't know me might be watching for the first time. My name is Jeff Savage, and I'm the pastor of Sailor Beach Bible Church. And we're broadcasting here from our new location this morning. As we believe Hebrews 10.25 tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, especially as you see the day approaching. And due to our current circumstances, and by the order of the Nicoya Municipality, which for those of you in the U.S. that are watching, is the governmental agency here um, in town, we're assembling from here today for our first ever broadcast. This was supposed to be the first time that we were going to meet from our new location, and uh, unfortunately it's uh, in trying times, but we want to make sure that we assemble as the body of Jesus Christ this morning. And so we're going to do that from here, we're going to do it live on Facebook. So hopefully everybody's with us this morning. And uh, I just want you to know this format will continue, and will continue to come to you in this particular way until uh, we have the ability to meet here together, which time we'll let everybody know that we'll come down here and enjoy our great church uh, again, one time uh, for all. So we just uh, we appreciate everybody being here today. And uh, we appreciate, you know, everybody who supported us and has helped us to get this ready and to answer questions about how to do this, uh, you know, our wonderful body of Jesus, and we just appreciate everything. Uh, normally here in a church service this morning, we would, uh, we would go into corporate worship, but because this is our first time, and really not sure if you guys are going to be able to see the screen perfectly, uh, we're going to do a song at the end, but we're going we're gonna to not do the corporate worship and maybe integrate that as we figure that out for next week. But we have some really important things to talk about this morning. So in, in essence of time, we're going to put that aside until the end of the service this morning and we're going to go ahead and get right into it. Uh, for, for those of you who regularly attend San Beach Bible Church, you know that uh, you know that we start with the same two verses all the time. And we're going to read with those. I want you guys to read with me this morning as we read through those. And the first one is Hebrews 4.12. It says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-inch sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. A very important verse when it comes to Bible churches. We believe that... The Bible is the inspired word of God, and 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. We're not going to put this verse up this morning, but 2 Corinthians 10.4 says, For the weapons of our, our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, through the pulling down of strongholds. That's what the word of God is. It is our weapon against Satan's strongholds. And we see our world has changed. And Satan is using one of his most effective weapons, a stronghold against this world and against the church of Jesus Christ at this very moment. There are churches closed all over the world because of the coronavirus. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are the word of God. And we use them this morning to teach to understand that fear for a Christian is really not an option. God teaches us that we should not be fearful. And in His Word it says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. That is 2 Timothy 1.7. Um, self-control. The, the Greek word that self-control there is so phonismo. Greek, interesting, interesting word, really means sound perspective, an understanding, a discerning of what is going on. Sound mind is what some of the other translations we use to describe it. And all of us, this entire world, at this moment in history, needs sound perspective this morning. Keep forgetting to point that in the right direction. So, in other words, Keep calm and pray on. Right? Philippians 4 6 says, Be anxious for nothing. For nothing. It's a very carefully chosen word that there is nothing that should make us anxious because God is in control. But in everything by prayer, in supplication, gratitude, make your request. 
requests known to God. Prayer. Prayer is the greatest defense. And prayer is the greatest medicine that we can possibly have. Defense against this virus. Medicine for this virus. Medicine for this fear that we have. When we are in prayer to the Almighty God, anxiousness melts away. And so we will join together in prayer this morning. Let's, let's open up with a word of prayer right now. Father God, we just thank you. Lord God, we thank you for the technology that we have that even though the world is shut down, we can still, we can still broadcast a sermon to all of our people, to other people who are watching it this morning. Father God, we thank you for the promises that you put in your word that we should not be anxious, that we should not be afraid of this, that we should see this as the opportunity that it truly is. Father God, I just bless the service this morning. Father, I ask that you would open minds and hearts this morning to receive your word and to put it in the perspective that you intended it to have. Lord God, we give you all the glory for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Title of this morning, or the sermon this morning, as you can see, is birth pains. Um, we're going to be talking about birth pains. We're going to be talking about what that means in the Bible. And, and I want to show you in God's Word that the paradigm shift, and we went through a paradigm shift in this world, that the paradigm shift that we currently see in the world isn't any kind of a surprise to God. In fact, Jesus himself clearly lines out what to look for as the day approaches. We were talking about Hebrews 10, 25. That we will know what these things look like as the day approaches. And so after Jesus correctly prophesied the, prophesied the destruction of the temple to his disciples, uh, his disciples came to him privately later on the Mount of Olives and asked him questions. They said, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Very important questions for all of us here this morning. Aren't those things that they have asked Jesus at that time long, long ago exactly the questions that all of us at this particular moment would want to answer and we would want to be able to understand? Aren't those things that we would love the ability to be able to say, yes, we understand these things? Luckily for us, Jesus answered those questions. Those very questions that we just talked about, he answered those for his disciples way back then and put it in His Word, in the Bible, for us to be able to have today for comfort in hard times. So here it is. It says, Jesus answered them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. For all these things must happen, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, epidemics and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. I want to stop right there for just a second and I want to point something out. Depending upon the translation that you are using this morning, if you're following along in your own Bibles, you will see many of the translations mean birth pains. It will say birth pains. Birth pains, and this was used, beginning of sorrows was also a, a, a terminology that was used in, old, in, you know, in New Testament times as, as understanding that, that it was travail, that it was increasing, that it was progressive. Birth pains, if you, you went through them, you'll know. Kind of started out with a, ooh. But they build to something much, much greater. And I want you to understand that when it says this is the beginning of sorrows, that I want you to compare that to the birth pains that we're talking about. And understand that this is a progressive movement from times when you will recognize it to the end. Um, yeah, we're going to see real examples this morning of all of these warnings. Let me finish. Then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will rise and will deceive many because iniquity will abound. The love of many will grow cold. So also, when you shall see all these things, you know that it is near, even at the doors. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. But I'm going to try to show you this morning that when Jesus Christ was speaking these words to his disciples, 
disciples that this is the generation that he was speaking of. Well, we, we, we we're seeing uh, by Facebook here, some people are not seeing the broadcast, even though I can see it on, uh, on Robin's phone. But we're going to continue and we'll put it up later. If, uh, you know, so that everybody will be able to see it on Facebook later, if we can't see it here right now. Um, Alright, where was I? Okay, yes. Uh, we're going to see visual proof this morning from a lot of sources that birth pains have indeed begun. We'll see these very things that Jesus Christ told us are not only at the doorstep, and although they are progressive, that they have crossed over the threshold into a new time, a new paradigm. Now, understand that there are more than 100 prophecies in the Old Testament that were actually filled within the verses and, 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 and uh, stories that we are able to look at in the New Testament. Reliability of Scripture is not even a debatable item. You know, Zoltar, Magnificent, or your magic ball can't come anywhere close to answering the questions that are answered and understood within the prophetic. And more than a hundred have come true in the New Testament itself. But let me go on from there. Because there are many that talk about Israel. And many people here, as Jesus is speaking in Matthew 24, we'll see later on that he talks about and gives an example of the fig tree. And many believe that what he was talking about was actually the occurrence that Israel would be reborn as a nation. And there are many scriptures in the Old Testament that talk about that very thing. And how could that be? Israel wasn't even a nation for more than 1,900 years. But God, in His work, is infallible. And He made His promises. And He made them promises that Israel would begin to become a nation. Like Isaiah 41, Israel will prevail over its enemies. That's historical. Check. Amos chapter 9, the ruins of Israel will be rebuilt. Just do any kind of a photo survey about what Jerusalem and all of Israel looks like today, and you would say, yes, that's a check. Ezekiel chapter 36 says, Israel will greatly prosper. The economy of Israel, one of the largest economies in the world. Check. Israel 41, or Isaiah 41, the trees will again grow in Israel. What you have to understand there is that Back when the Jews began to start to come back to Jerusalem, back to Israel, back right after World War I, it was desolate. It was a desert. There was nothing there. Again, if you take, if you look at pictures on the internet of Israel, what it looks like today it is a beautiful place. There are trees and gardens everywhere. Jesus, God, fulfilled that promise. Isaiah 27, Israel's fruit will fill the land. Israel is a leading producer of agriculture and technology products. And the best fruit of all, Israel is responsible for the spread of Christianity. All of those apostles were Jewish. All of those apostles were Jewish. And the best fruit that could possibly come out of any nation was Christianity. Uh, Micah 4 1, Jerusalem would become the world's most religious site. It's the only place on the entire planet that is argued over, fought over, occupied by four different religions all at the same time. Everybody wants a piece of Israel. Everybody wants a piece of Jerusalem. So we see that this prophecy is also fulfilled in the rebirth of Israel. Yeah, Ezekiel chapter 29, Egypt will never again rule over Israel. Now they tried in 1948, they tried in 1967, and they tried in 1973, and even though they're ten times the size, and in all three of those cases had a much larger and mightier army, they were defeated because God does not fail His promises. And those things came to pass. And we have Zechariah chapter 8 and Isaiah chapter 43 that says that the Jews would return to their land, that the Jews would again occupy the city of Jerusalem. And we have seen that come to pass in this generation. A small sample, just a very small sample of mathematically impossible prophetic fulfillment found in the Bible. If all of these things came to pass, 
perfectly accurate. We need to heed Jesus' prophetical teachings right here because they're Jesus' directly and understand that the things that he tells us, the things that he talks about in his promises to us are even more amazing than what we have seen before. So let's go on. There will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men fainting from fear and expectation of what is coming on the inhabited earth. For the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption is drawing near. A friend of mine, who well, I used to work for, uh, posted an incredibly disturbing Facebook interaction between uh, a friend of hers, and, and it literally was uh, a suicide note. And people came and argued with this particular person and, and tried to talk him down and ultimately began to take life. And it's, it's an un unbelievably sad, uh, it's a sad thing to see. It's a sad, sad thing to watch because in it, within it, you could see the things that this person would talk about. Distress and complexity. I don't understand what's going on. I can't do this anymore. I don't have the strength to, you know, to carry on. This world is crazy. And he's right. And he was hopeless. He had no hope. He said, there, he even said, there is no hope. I'm, I'm done. It is sad to me. And it hurts to me this morning because there is hope. There is absolute, unbelievable, life-changing, world-changing hope in the person of Jesus Christ and what he accomplished on the cross for everyone else. Unbelievable. So let's look, let's, let's go and let's look a little further into some signs. It says, Now, brothers, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and concerning our gathering together unto him, we ask you not to let your mind be quickly shaken or be troubled, neither in spirit nor by the word nor by the letter, coming as though from us, as if the day of Christ is already here. Do not let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless a falling away comes first. People who attend this church, you know that I speak about this quite often. In fact, we did an entire series on it six or eight months ago. It was posted on www.sandrobeachbiblechurch.com those of you who didn't have a chance to hear it, I want to go back and listen to it. Uh, because we're in the middle, smack dab in the middle of the greatest apostasy, the greatest falling away of all times. Uh, you know, falling away has come. So apostasy has come and it's growing its strength every single day. And what used to be hidden in secret is now out the open. There's no shame. There's no false bar. People are readily accepting a new gospel, gospel light. The fact that it is the gospel of man that we have to do something here on earth works to be able to usher in this new time that is all false, is all a false gospel. It will not save you. It will not save anyone. It's one of Satan's greatest attempts to keep people from hearing the truth. In the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we see it right here. We see that it is coming. And it is already here. Notice first that there shall come scoffers in the last days who walk after their own lusts and say, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things have continued as they were since the beginning of the creation. For they willingly ignore that by the word of God the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed, and standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then exists, existed was flooded with water and perished. 
But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Look, my grandmother, my grandmother truly believed that Jesus was going to come back in her time. My mother believed likewise that Jesus was going to come back during her life. Neither of those two things transpired. In fact, the Apostle Paul himself, even though he has written to us more than anyone else, giving us the opportunity to understand the signs, also believed and was watching for the signs of the times. And he believed that during his lifetime that he would see Jesus' return. And yet, until the very end of his life, he still looked for those signs and expected those signs to take place in his generation, as have Christians all from that point until today have looked for the signs that are the end of the times. He even made some of them that aren't true signs. But the Apostle Paul wrote in his second letter to Timothy, he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course and I have kept the faith. A crown of righteousness is laid up for me, which the Lord will give me on that day. And not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. So Paul didn't know the day, but Paul knew the seasons. Paul knew the signs, and he wrote about it. He didn't see the signs in his life because it wasn't time. It was not time yet. But the time is upon us. And he taught those same things as Jesus taught as a warning passed on to us this morning. Let's continue. Concerning the times and the seasons, this is Paul writing, Brothers, you have no need that I write to you, for you know perfectly that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor upon a woman with a child, with child, meaning her things. And they shall not escape. But you, brothers, pay close attention to this. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the sons of light and the sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. As far as Thessalonians 5, 1 through 6, if you can't see the board, look it up. It's greatly encouraging for us this morning. You, brothers and sisters, you, ladies and gentlemen, are not in the dark these days. These days should not sleep, sneak up like a thief in the night. We should be able to look to the words of Jesus and understand that these days are exactly as he told us that they would be. We must be alert and we must be sober and we must look to the signs. Robin and I live, uh, she's here with this boy, she's my audience here at the church. <laughs> But Robin and I live in, in, the, in the midst of a forest. Huge, huge trees all around. And, and, and it gets breezy sometimes. And sometimes in November, December, January, it gets really, really breezy. I mean, really breezy. And so there are times when you're standing there looking out the window and you may hear or you may see a huge limb come down from one of those big trees. And sometimes we see those trees fall. All of us get this boat and they're gone. Huge trees that have been rooted in the soil for years and years and years. And the wind knocks them down and it's scary. It's like, oh my goodness, I can't. Wow, unbelievable. I was kind of close. I was, I was just right down the hill. And it can be concerning, but let me tell you something. When you hear the chainsaws start up, and you start hearing the sound of those chewing into a trunk of a tree, and then you see it fall, that was no surprise, because you understand that a chainsaw, when it comes to a tree, is a sign that it's about to fall. We are talking about the same kinds of things. If we're unaware, if the wind is blowing the trees, and we are unaware of maybe something that, that, that concerns us or scares us, but we have those chainsaws running, cutting away at that tree. When that tree falls, there's no surprise in it. We were able to judge the sign 
and understand in advance of the event that was going to take place. And we can just look at that this morning and say, we understand these signs, and we are not taken aback by any of the things that are happening. So let's look to the signs. Let's take a look at the signs. Wars and rumors of wars. Nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom. This is a map of the current conflicts, tribal conflicts, national conflicts around the entire world. Uh, it's, it's a map of the entire, uh, international crisis group. Like I said, we're going we're to be presenting you know, facts here this morning, not something I've made up. These are facts. And this is what the world looks like right now in war. Uh, you know, every place that you see, everything except the white, if you can see that, is, is a war. Or a tribal, you know, conflict. Nation against nation. Ethnos against ethnos. Kingdom against kingdom. Asalidia against Asalidia. Is right here on this map for us to take a look at. I'd like to point something else out to you. And I want to tell you this. That not this particular pandemic that we're in, but all of the end time prophecies that come from the book of Revelation, farther and closer to the end, all are centered at one point on the globe, and that is the city of Jerusalem. So let me show you something here real quick. If you can see it, that little circle right there is Jerusalem. If you can see that map this morning, I would like you to look at that where most of those wars are taking place and understand that our circle this morning is the epicenter of most of the conflict on the globe at this particular point. It's, a, it's kind of amazing. It's kind of amazing. And if you were to ask, <laughs> why is that particular point the epicenter? And you look to scripture, you would understand because that is where everything, all the prophecies at the very end, are going to center on that piece of real estate that God gave to Israel so many years ago. How about there will be famines? There will be famines. Here's a map. This is a uh, this is the hunger map 2020. I'm sorry, 2019. Uh, it, it's hard to believe that this image is the beginning of sorrows. If you're able to see this, it's, it's one eight hundred twenty one billion people. One in nine people on the planet today doesn't get enough to eat. Some of them are in dire straits. Some of them are over 35% of the population of these particular places are hungry or starving. Fans. They don't have to look like what you believe they look like. There just isn't enough food in these particular places for everybody to eat and have their fill. And this is the beginning of birth pains. This is a sad sad piece of information. What will it look like as the birth pains get closer and ultimate labor becomes inevitable? It's heartbreaking. And, again, in our circle, very, very interesting that most of the world's hunger is around our little circle. Most of the world's difficulty in finding food is around our little circle. It, it's amazing to me that this, you know, that this is not any kind of a surprise to Scripture, that it tells us that in the end this will be where everything is centered in the middle. And of course, there's one on everybody's mind right now. It's epidemics, correct? Epidemics. Remember how I said that this was all progressive, that it was the beginning of sorrows, that the birth pains were beginning. I would like to show you something this morning. And I don't, again, I don't know if you can see this. So we'll post this so everybody can watch on watch your phone. Probably difficult to see. But if you watch it on a computer, you might be able to pick this up. This is a uh, this is a graph that shows six the beginning. That uh, since the beginning, that we have an issue here with uh, uh, zero, you know, zero, not AD or BC, but zero, and that's where keeping track of uh, of pandemics started. And if you look in the very beginning, there's about 200 years between the graph on the side of this on the side of 
about 200 years between, and we see some things happening there. And then we go to it uh, a little bit further, and now it's only 100 years between the time that we're watching these pandemics take place. And then we go a little bit farther, and now there's only 50 years between the graph on the side of this thing that we, when we see pandemics taking place. And then right here it changes to there's only 25 years between each one of these pandemics taking place. And if you go down here, you'll see that currently in the last 25 years, nowhere else in all of history, but in the last 25 years, AIDS is this big red one over here still going on, but in the last 25 years, there have been six epidemics. You call AIDS a pandemic is everywhere in the world. You can call coronavirus a pandemic is everywhere. It is everywhere in the world. You can call the swine flu. You can call SARS. All those things epidemics that became worldwide. It's amazing to see the escalation of these things right before our eyes. Now remember, it's all going to be progressive, and you know, I know that famines have been around forever, wars have been around forever, epidemics have been around forever. All of these things that Jesus talks about are not something that just all of a sudden popped up for us to go, oh, there's the sign, finally. But what we have to realize is that the escalation of birth pains, the closer together and more intense that these things come over time, the closer we are to that day. To that time. So let's take a look at some other things. Earthquakes. If you take a look over the last 50, 60 years, magnitude 6.0 earthquakes have increased. Has there been a year and up and down? Sure. Absolutely. But if you take and draw a line across what is happening, which we looked at, by the way, this comes from the uh, 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 the earthquake thing in the United States. Information directly from their website. And if we take a look at what is happening here, there is no doubt that we are seeing an escalation of large scale earthquakes across the globe. If you take a look at the graph that shows the smaller ones, it, it, it's, it's, even, it's even more pronounced. Even more pronounced. Now, big ones have been pretty steady, you know, over seven, over seven and a half. They've been pretty steady throughout history. But what will happen? in the end, when maybe even those large scale, very large scale earthquakes begin to increase in intensity. There's no doubt that this is a birth pain, and that this birth pain is beginning to escalate. How about other signs? You got right here is a graph that shows all disasters. All disasters, this is from the NatCat service, which is a German global research firm that keeps track of natural disasters in the world. On, on the right hand side here, we have uh, you know, disasters compared to earthquakes. And if you look at just earthquakes and their intensity gain against what natural disasters look like, we'll look at a scripture here in just a second that kind of points that out. You know, it, it's amazing. The increase in severity and intensity has to be considered. But what about this? Everybody talks about global warming, right? This is a graph. Uh, this is from NOAA. Uh, the, the, the solar irradiance and what it's been doing and increasing over time. Ladies and gentlemen, the sun's getting brighter. <laughs> I can feel it. I can feel it here in Costa Rica, and you don't want to be outside without sunscreen for more about 20, 25 minutes, or, you know, you, you will not be the same color that you were before you went and ventured forth. It's increasing. Romans chapter 8, verse 22 says this. Is that we, we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until the present time. Ladies and gentlemen, when sin entered the world, creation was marred. Creation wants more than anything to get back to the way things were. And it is groaning. It is as in childbirth, labor pains. We see this all throughout Scripture. And it is there for a reason for us to be able to understand that these signs are not out of, out of the world. That these signs 
are fun. So what's the other thing that we see? I'm falling away. As you know, I talk about that, just like we talked about at the very beginning, I talk about it a lot. I talk about it a lot. It's something we definitely need to protect ourselves from. Um, this is really, really important. Because this, we are told, will, will become so intense and so perverse that it will even, if it was possible, it would even take the elect by surprise. That it would deceive even those who are in Christ. We have to know what Scripture tells us. We have to protect ourselves from this. We have to know what the Bible says about the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't accept any kind of substitute at all. Okay, so if you are going to a church and anything that does not point to or lead to Jesus Christ or tell you that Jesus Christ is everything you need, it is not the gospel. It is a false gospel. Jesus Christ is all we need. Jesus Christ will fulfill our needs. He will protect us. I'm not saying that people won't get sick. And when, when, when the Bible tells us you know, that, that God needs all things for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose, you have to understand that His perspective is not my little, short, vaporous life. That if you are in Jesus Christ, when you end up with Him in eternity, that is good. That is good. And that's the end of the game for everyone that accepts Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Anything that does not tell you that Jesus Christ is salvation is not the gospel. If it doesn't tell you, if it says anything else can save you, if it alludes to that anything else can save you, it is not the gospel of God's word. And we need to protect ourselves against it. Anything that does not tell you that Jesus Christ finished all works on the cross is not the gospel. It's the gospel of grace. It's sufficient. It tells us in the Bible that it is sufficient. We don't have to do anything except, except Jesus Christ is our personal Savior to save us from what is coming in the future, from eternal damnation. It doesn't take me standing up here preaching every Sunday to guarantee my place in heaven. It does not take you being a good tither and giving your money and sending it online to all kinds of false preachers or false prophets. It doesn't take anything more than accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Now there are, there's a way to do that, but there's a way not to do that. We'll talk about here in a minute. Worldly knowledge, wisdom, and a perverted gospel from above is a lie. It's a false gospel. I was watching a video last night that uh, was showing uh, every year you know, that there are a lot of, well, you may not know, but there's a lot of uh, false prophets that get, get, get together. These are people that call themselves Christians. And they get together and they, uh, they give their prophecies for the year. I'm sort of a prophetic update on what's going to happen in the year to come. And they all get together in January. This is uh, even after, you know, uh, after we knew that there was a such a thing as a coronavirus. And that got huge at that particular point. There's not one single one of the 20. They gave their prophetical announcements to the world that said anything about an epidemic, a pandemic, that was going to shut down the world. Not a single one of them. In fact, most of them were talking about this was going to be the largest transfer of wealth ever seen. Well, there's been a transfer of wealth, but it was in the wrong direction. And people were talking about there's going to be a movement of God that's bigger than it's ever been seen. Stadiums will be busting at the seams. Have you seen pictures of stadiums lately? We have to be very, very careful in the people that we listen to. And if they're prophetic, and I'm quoting that, does it come straight from the pages of the God's Word? It's a false prophecy. And it is a false gospel. And we need to prepare ourselves because these things are going to get 
even worse. If your church isn't pre preaching Jesus Christ crucified, get out. If the service never makes you think or maybe even make you a little com uncomfortable, it's all, oh, well, here's a, here's a self-betterment sermon. Well, that's okay as long as they're telling you that the best, the self-betterment sermon is accepting Jesus Christ. Other than that, you know, you don't need to know how to make a Facebook page or things that modern churches are trying to tell you how to do. We know from Scripture that the world won't recover from this pandemic. It's going to go away. Things will semi-return to normal. But there's going to be a future time of peace and safety, peace and prosperity. So this is a blip, but it's a blip for a reason. It's a blip for a reason. There's been a paradigm shift, been a big paradigm shift. And if you look, Politico just posted an op-ed piece about that very thing, the things that are going to change in this world because of this virus. We no longer live in the same world that we lived in a month ago. It is different. There's been a huge shift. And we as Christians also need to make a paradigm shift. This can no longer be business as usual. It is being about the Father's business, not business as usual. One to me.